Uh, hello, well, first of all, welcome for the invitation. It's a great pleasure being here, and I thought it's maybe also nice to explain the reason why I became a designer in the first place. Uh, I was actually born in the Netherlands in a small village, and both of my parents are artists. One is a painter, the other one a sculptor. And I realized and I saw during my life and when I grew up how difficult it is being an artist and how difficult it is to survive. And the theme of today is limitations. Well, one of the limitations as being an artist is to survive money-wise. Um, so that made me decide uh, to stay in this creative field or within this creative world but to go more towards the direction of applied arts. And in the Netherlands, in Eindhoven, there was a very nice school, uh, the Design Academy, and they are really in the middle or in the border or the gray area of artistic values and applied arts or reproducible objects. And uh, I went actually straight after high school, I went into the Design Academy and I was quite young when I graduated. And then I realized, okay, what do I do next? Um, do I know enough to start my own company? Uh, or shall I just get some experience first? So I decided to work for two other design studios uh, to gain some experience and to see how the industry was working, to see how the whole field was operating. Um, so I started my own company. I did a lot of freelance work for three years. Uh, I worked part-time, and the other half I invested in my own studio, developed my own work. And one of the most crucial decisions I wanted to make for myself is to design a vocabulary, or to develop my own vocabulary of shape and outcomes and experiments. Um, and this was actually one of the first presentations I had in Milan at the Salone del Mobile. I made some products for an exhibition in Eindhoven and someone from Vitra, the Swiss company, they did the styling for the stand, so they also use other products to make the stand look a bit more like a living room and they chose two of the projects I worked on. One is a mirror, as you can see in the back, and the other one on the table were some vases I made. So I made those pieces myself without a commission and this was a great sort of Kickstarter or way to launch it. And then slowly by slowly the, the snowball started to roll and it got bigger. And then after three years I decided to quit as a freelancer and fully dedicate all my time to my own work. Which was also a very big risk. I mean we've heard it before today money wise. It's always a risk to put all your time, effort and money in your own work. Uh, and this is one of the first projects I did. Because in general I made a selection of the work I did and a selection of the portfolio. And most of the projects I will show today are based on material experiments. Um, and my intention is always to zoom into a material and try to find the essence or the identity or the true DNA of a material. And in general, I mostly work with wood, metal and stone. So very natural materials, plain materials, which have been used for centuries. Uh, but still they can, yeah, the technology changes, the culture changes. So I want to experiment with it, and this is a project I did in collaboration with a very close friend of mine, David Derksen, he's also a Dutch designer. Um, and we looked at mirrors, because sometimes at mirrors in bathrooms you see these black spots appearing. It's an oxidization process uh, due to the humidity and the water and the heat and the moisture. It starts to oxidize. And we were wondering, uh, the silver, I mean, it, it sort of breathed, breathes, and we were wondering what happens between these black spots and the perfect silver. There is some kind of a transformation. So we experimented a lot. We bought some cheap mirrors at IKEA. We scraped off the paint of the back, put some chemicals on it, and step by step, we started to learn how this process actually worked. And we made these pieces where you can actually see on the left side is the perfect silver mirror. And in the middle, the little triangle, uh, the, the purple one, is the, yeah, the longest step of oxidization. And we used chemicals in a bath to oxidize it. And with every step, we peel away a sticker of the mirror. And in total, it takes six minutes to oxidize it. There's a lot of preparation, of course, but the oxidizing takes six minutes. And then we, uh, we put a coating on it to protect it again, because otherwise it would oxidize as well. 
So in general, I'm mostly fascinated about uh, developing techniques, developing experiments, and from those things, there's a lot of different outcomes. So we made a series of objects, um, and from those objects, we get a lot of commissions nowadays for restaurants, bars, uh, interiors, and this is a recent one we did for a hotel in Amsterdam. It's 160 rooms, and in every room they wanted to have a mirror. And then we also decided not to produce them ourselves anymore, because I want to be a designer, not a manufacturer. So we found a supplier in Italy that could do it and that could produce it for us. Um, so if you develop a technique or an experiment, the outcome can be very different uh, to what you normally can come up with. Uh, this is a project where I later on will also get back to because it's a frustration in a way. Not all the things work out always. Um, I was asked by the Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands to design a commemorative coin. And it was actually for the World Wildlife Fund, 50 year anniversary. And they asked a group of designers to come up with a coin. And I tried to think of capturing the 50 years as sort of a symbolic value on a very small piece of metal. And of course for the world wildlife you think of nature and impact, the environment, sort of a footprint that we leave. And I thought a, a coin is actually just hitting a piece of metal very hard and it leaves a stamp. So I thought if I use an animal for it, because I wanted to use the flora and the fauna for the front and the back side of the coin. I thought I have to use the most iconic animal in nature and the most heavy animal to make a real footprint. So I went to the zoo in Amsterdam and I asked if I could borrow the elephant for a day. And uh, luckily they were willing to collaborate. Um, and as you can see, I used a bucket of sand. It's actually sort of oily sand, so it leaves a very good impression. And the funny thing is that the elephants are trained to lift their foot because they get a pedicure or a manicure. I don't know which one of the two, but one of both. Um, so they can really lift their foot and put it down on the ground again. And here you can see the footprint. And actually the coin is designed on a one-to-one -one scale because normally it's a 22 millimeter piece, so they really had to scale it down. And um, on the other side, I wanted to use the world of plants or trees. So as you can see on the left, I spend the whole day counting all the annual rings of the trees because I wanted a tree that was exactly 50 years old because otherwise it didn't fit in the concept. And then I experimented within the wood uh, to make it into a texture for the coin because a coin is just shadows reflecting in the metal. And I sunblasted the wood to get a texture. And what actually happens with the sunblasting is that an annual ring consists of a summer part and a winter part, and in summer the tree grows really fast. Uh, so in summer it's very soft, and in winter time the tree keeps all its energy together. So it's very hard, and if you touch it with the same amount of pressure, you get a relief or a texture. As you can see there, of course the queen had to be on it, but uh, that was part of the deal, let's say. And uh, in the end, unfortunately, the coin was not executed, because of some conceptual issues, uh, legal issues. It's a very long story because as soon as you start working for the government, you get political sides. It's, it's so many complicated things involved within this process to actually get something done. And after this coin proposal, they asked me four times again and they were never executed. So it became a real big frustration, coin design. And I will get to that later, how to respond to this frustration. Um, this is a piece that I made for my graduation work um, and it was actually about natural materials and seeing where they actually come from, sourcing them and also to see how industry uh, yeah, processes them. So from a raw tree I went to, uh, to the forest council, it's called in the Netherlands, and I asked if I could use a tree and then to see how they would process the tree until a final branch, let's say. And one of the first things they did in the, in the forest is cutting off the branches. And I said, no, 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 please leave them on because it's such a nice connection from the horizontal piece to the vertical piece. And they actually left it on and I tried to use it as a functional element. So as you can see here in the table, the flat surface is actually the log of the tree and the branches come out of it as one single piece. So actually this ornament could not be made by a carpenter because it's a solid 
joinery that, yeah, it, I mean, it took years and years to grow it. And I only try to isolate it. And one of the things that I use a lot in my work is the contrast between industry and nature of combining those two worlds. And besides that, I also made a series of shelves um, because if they cut a tree, maybe you can see it here as well. Uh, you see the white wood on the ring. It's actually uh, yeah, the poor quality wood, so they always throw it away. And in general, it's approximately 30 to 40 percent of waste that they produce from, from a tree. That's, yeah, it's a real pity. So I said, no, 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 please keep it together. Cut it the way you always cut it within this geometric grid, but keep it intact. And then I make it into an exploded view. So actually you open up the tree and the whole pattern is continuous and you can reproduce irregularity because in nature or in industry, they throw it away because it's too irregular for them. And I said, please keep it together because in that way we can reproduce this irregularity. And you can make lots of variations. So a high, thick one, a very elegant, thin one. Um, and then I realized um, if you graduate, you make a lot of expensive work, difficult work. It always ends up with galleries or collectors or musea. And I was really fed up with it because I couldn't even aff afford my own work. It simply became too expensive. So I had to sell it in order to stay alive. And then a group of friends, we decided to go to Milan to the furniture fair have a group exhibition and I wanted to make something for industry so I really thought about how can you make a cheap product which is reproducible and um, I made a series of shelves, wall shelves and the whole idea actually came from industry because it started with a steel sheet it's two by one meters I made circles out of it which are all 33.3 centimeters so yeah they fit very efficient you don't have any waste and I made one incision and then they were all folded in a different way. So you have one for in the corner, one for around the corner and one for a flat wall. And luckily the first person that came up to me in Milan were the people from Hay. And they said, yeah, can we please take it and put it in the collection? So I said, yeah, sure, it's a nice company. I would like to work with you. The only thing was they had a meeting in China with a supplier the day after, so I had to take them off the wall, and then I had an empty presentation in Milan, but it was okay. It's, yeah, well, it, it wasn't that easy, but in the end it worked out. And one of the reasons why I wanted to show this product um, is in general we always think that it's a lot of development, it's very difficult to make a product, but sometimes you also have a happy accident. And uh, while I was actually making these, I wanted to do some podiums as well, where you present the work, these simple wooden blocks. And we were cutting all the angles on the 45 degrees. And at the end of the day, I was cleaning the workshop and I found this little block, like an offcut. And I thought, okay, it's a nice piece, what can it be? So I walked around the studio for 10 minutes and I realized it could be a hook. And then three days before Milan, I was spray painting and making 10 more. And it was done. <laughs> and it was done. They took it in the collection. So it can be very easy as well. Um, this project is very special to me because it started as a self-initiated project and later on it was being mass produced. Um, in my work I never used color because I always used natural materials. So wood has a color, stone has a color. And then I try to add color but in a way that it has a certain meaning and that the color is very related to the actual material. So I looked outside to churches and statues and there you always see a patina or an oxidized surface. And it gives a lot of information on the actual material. So what I did is I analyzed different metals, different alloys. Um, I was really, really reading these children, children books for chem chemistry and oxidizing and to see how it worked because in high school I wasn't really paying attention because I didn't realize as a designer I could maybe use it. So I spent a long time working on these recipes, developing it, experimenting with it. And this was the first outcome. It was very abstract, sort of non-functional, where you see the, the perfect metal, the cultivated polished metal, and the chemical reaction. And these two are always related because not every color is possible on every metal. So in the first exhibition I had these as sort of a experiment or samples and later on I wanted to make them as a product or something people could use. So I oxidized metal tubes, put them in a lathe or a turning bench and then scraped off a little piece of the top 
So you also get the contrast between the perfect metal and the oxidized metal. And the funny thing is I showed this to a Danish company and tradition. They took it in production. They found a supplier somewhere in Asia. I don't even know exactly where it was produced. But the first batch, I think they made 10,000 pieces. It was rejected by the quality control because they said they were not perfectly consistent. And they called me and they said, yeah, the whole batch, the, I think it was three shipping... 10,000 pieces. Yeah, 10,000 pieces. They're all rejected, three shipping containers. Nothing is good. So I said, yeah, but why? Why isn't it good? Yeah, they're all the same. And I said, well, it's sort of the ID, so don't worry. Just send them over and it's probably good. And they're actually selling quite well now. And what's maybe nice to know, because um, we were speaking about... Or I heard a lot about limitations before. And what I really learned as a design studio is not only to make a living, but also to survive on the long term. And when I just started, I made stuff and I sold it. So it's a very direct income. You produce something, you sell it, and you get the money. But now I want to invest more in royalties. So if you do something for a company, they do the production, they do the distribution, the sales, everything, marketing, promotion. And then once every three months, you get a small amount per sold piece. So it's an investment in the beginning because you don't make any money out of it, but on the long run, you don't have to put any work in it or you don't have to... Uh, and you personally, what, what, did, uh, what did you choose? What is better for you? Well, the Wait. thing is, I, I prefer royalties because, yeah, you don't have to work for it anymore. You have to work in the beginning, but afterwards it goes by itself. But the only problem is the bridge towards direct selling and royalties because it takes a long time to develop a product and then it has to be distributed all over the world. So let's say from the first design sketch to the first invoice or the first bill, it can take up to two or three years. So I prefer royalties, but it's a long-term strategy. And now I've been doing it for three years and it's about... 15 or 20 products. In the beginning, I thought one product is enough. You're rich and you're done and you go on a holiday, but you need a lot of products in order to stay alive. And of course, uh, pieces go out of the collection as well. So then you have to renew it and uh, yeah, put new products in the collection. What I showed before with the sunblasting of the wood for the coin, it brought me into another ID for a Dutch gallery. He asked me to do a, a, a commission. It was sort of a carte blanche, so I could do whatever I wanted. And I wanted to investigate this technique of sunblasting further, but then in a very thin scale. So um, we made a collection of pieces from very small, affordable pieces to very large pieces. And we used thin material, and then we sunblasted it. And what you can see is that the wood actually becomes transparent because the winter rings, they stay and the summer rings go away. So it's almost like a X-ray scan or a D yeah, it shows the hidden parts of the wood in, a, in quite a nice way. And then we made a whole collection about it, a small samples, matches of course, because wood burns and the structure of the sunblasting really refers to matches. Some cabinets as well and in the end, the collection. And what I, for instance, also very much liked about the presentation of Studio Swine is that you see the process of making things. In the end, we always see the final finished product and it looks perfect, but actually the, the, the road towards it is much more important. And with this product, uh, project, we spent half a year on experimentation, trial and error. And in the end, we had so much yeah, story to tell before we could actually show the end product that we decided to make a book of the, or of, of the process because we saw the process as a product as well. And then we thought, how can you sell the process as a product? So we made it into a booklet. We went to a Dutch publisher, Frame Magazine. It's a design magazine. And they were actually willing to publish it. So that was also new for us uh, that it worked out in a nice way. Uh, this is another project that I wanted to show, uh, which is more about the gallery world and more the collector's aspect of design. I was fascinated about natural stone and where it actually came from. So I went to the quarry in Belgium, where they literally take it out of the ground, process it into kitchen tops, uh, floor tiles, etc. And I wanted to see how it actually went, because again, they go from very geometric or organic pieces into geometric reproducible yeah reproducible items 
And I wanted to make a table out of one piece of stone, which shows exactly the contrast between the natural shape and the perfect geometry of industry. So to give you an impression, this was the prototype of the table. The blade, or the saw blade, it's around six meters high. So, yeah, so it's probably just as high as the screen, more or less. So it's a massive machine in a massive industry. And this was the project where I didn't touch the piece for the first time in my life, because it's so heavy, it's so big. So it felt more like choreography, where you have to explain all the steps and how you want it. So I didn't even touch the pieces. Uh, then it went to another factory in the Netherlands, um, where we were sort of emptying out the piece, the sculpture, to make it more lightweight, because it's a very, very heavy block. It started off as 11 tons, so 11,000 kilograms, and in the end it was around 2,000 kilograms, which is still quite heavy for a table, but anyhow. Um, we used the internal structure of the stone, because it's a sediment stone, so it has a horizontal layer. And we made a grid right under the tabletop, as you can see a bit on the left picture. The grooves, they go in 10 centimeters above the tabletop. And because it's a horizontal layer in the stone, you can very easily open up the structure. And this was a commission for a client in Brussels for a private house. He wanted a table to throw his keys on when he came home. Uh, which is fine, I mean, he paid the bill, so whatever he do, does on the table, it's okay with me. Um, and because it's such a heavy piece, we had to make a special transportation box, a way of installing it in the house. Um, they actually had to reinforce the structure, so the engineer had to redo the, the foundation to make it stronger, uh, to make the table fit. This is another commission in Canada where they also had to do the foundation again because it was simply too heavy. And luckily there's clients which are willing to do these kind of projects because it gives you a lot of freedom to experiment on other work. Um, this is a picture of the process in Brussels, the placement. And I always ask the client five or ten times, are you sure that you want it in this place or one centimeter to the left? Because as soon as it's no there, way back. <laughs> no way back now. And probably if they move the table, they will call me because I don't think they can lift it themselves. Um, this is a photo that I really wanted to show because in nature, everything is scalable. You can work on a very small scale and on a very large scale. And I made this myself. It's actually a tiny stone. It's one uh, scale 1 to 10, so it's 20 by 10 centimeters. And I photographed it in such a way that you cannot see the scale anymore. And I already sold three tables from this picture where a client asked, can I buy this table? And then I would say, no, it's just sold this one, but I can make a new one for you. And uh, that's actually this one. Uh, so this is the model, the original, and this is the real table that we made out of it. So they're quite similar. This is for a museum in Stockholm. Um, and yeah, as I said before, sometimes it's very important to make a living out of what you do. And this, for a couple of years, it was my bread and butter, as they say in English. So it's like your evergreen or the stuff you make to survive. And I was so frustrated about this coin design that I did before for the Ministry of Finance that I decided to destroy money instead of create money. And this was for an exhibition um, in the Netherlands, what was about the value of materials. And actually a coin is worth nothing in terms of metal, but they add a value to it by the government, which is also an insane system if you think about it, because they have a monopoly, monopoly to create value. They buy it for nothing and they sell it for a lot of money. And coins are also owned by the state. And in the Netherlands we have a monarchy with a king, so technically, if you make a jewel out of it, a ring, it becomes a crown jewel because it's still owned by the state. And I made it as a sort of a statement or a frustration, and then people decided to buy it. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think by now I sold, I, I lost counting exactly, but I think it's around 20,000 pieces. Uh, by the way, isn't it against the law? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny question, and no, it's not against the law, because I, I actually checked it out. I didn't want to have a claim from the government. Um, in the law, it says that if you destroy or change money, and you use it as money, it's a felony or it's a crime. But if you change the function, 
it's legal. And it's not money anymore, it's a ring. So in that sense, it's, it's legal. And I even help the government, I think, a bit more because we have VAT, the, the, the added tax, and it's 21%. And I just sell them legal. So 10 cents a ring is worth 20 euros. And from the 20 euros, you pay three and a half euros of tax. So Good business. <laughs> good business, even for them. They make a lot of money out of it as well. So um. uh, This is a project I did for an exhibition in Milan. And um, recently I've been working more and more on commissions. But this was a very open commission. It was from the UK magazine Wallpaper. They always connect a designer to a company. And I was co connected to a metal bending company and a blacksmith, a metalsmith. And I decided to make a scissor out of one piece. Because I saw the old Japanese scissors, which are made out of one piece, but they're very handcrafted. And I wanted to make an industrial version of this piece. So the first prototype was bent by a computer machine for the silhouette and then hammered by a smith to get the blades. And uh, this is the piece we also showed in Milan. And then we coated it in different finishes, so chrome, brass, and copper. And in the end, it was uh, taken by a Danish company, Nomas. So sometimes it's really nice to see how a self-initiated project ends up with a producer. And uh, these are being manufactured and sold as well. And it actually works quite well because it's also a symmetrical scissor. So it's for left and right-handed people. And normally it's two different scissors. So these are some pictures from, it, from them. And this is one of my most recent projects. It was done for an uh, Italian company, Abit Laminati. They make laminates. And they were very big in the Memphis time. And to me, they sell a very fake product because they always use it as a finish for cheap wood or for sort of a ugly, ugly core material. And what they do, they, do, they also do it in IKEA. They cover the whole surface, so all the sides. So it looks like a solid material, but it's actually nothing inside. And I decided to make it a bit more honest and to open it up to give every surface a different color. So you would actually see how they work and how they produce their material. And because every side has a different color, I wanted to play with the three-dimensionality of the object. So this is the same piece, but you can see it from four different directions. And every time the color palette changes. So this is a shelf that I made. From one side it's blue and green, and from the other side it's gray and pink. So it really plays with these dimensions of a flat material, actually. Um, and some other pieces, some cabinets as well. And this was a sort of a one-off project, so it went to galleries and some collectors as well. And hopefully I can get this into mass production as well. Uh, some simple podiums, some side tables, um, and... Yeah, here are the, this is actually also funny to mention. These are all paper models, so very tiny study models, and these are the actual pieces made by a manufacturer. Um, and the big pieces as well. And that was basically it. So thanks a lot for listening. We thank you. Tak, věřím, že tohle vás bavilo tak jako mě. Bude nějaký dotaz z publika, najde se někdo, kdo, koho by něco zajímalo na Lexe? Neříkejte, že chcete už domů. <laughs> Dobře, podíváme se, jestli přišlo něco na slajdu. Doufám, že něco jo. Tak. One question. <laughs> It's yours. Two questions. Ah, is there another pot in the room? What are you current? Ah, what am I currently working on? Um, yeah, the, it's actually quite nice because the last years um, uh, I've been working a lot, mostly on commissions for companies. And at a certain point, I was a bit fed up with it because the speed of design is getting bigger and bigger and higher and higher. And I have the idea that design is becoming a bit more like fashion. You have two, three, maybe four collections every year. And I adapted to this speed, so it's always the first idea, cheap to produce, fast to market, etc., etc. 
and I've been doing it for six years now and I decided to take a step back. So from July, um, I want to take half a year off, probably a year, uh, to work on my own. So I've been working with freelancers and interns and everyone's going outside of the studio and I really want to work alone to study, to experiment, to try out new things. And for now, I'm working on a project for social housing. Uh, I'm working on a new perfume bottle for a perfume brand. I cannot say which one, unfortunately. I signed the contract. I'm working on some new products for Hay, which are coming out soon. Uh, some ceramic tiles, actually a lot of different things from musea to mass production. But my aim is actually to be more silent and to calm down and yeah, to study. Uh, by the way, uh, do you think that you could be able to, to design something without the experiment? Just by the sketch? No, no, it's, it's a good question because I'm, I don't see myself as a designer actually. I'm very, very bad at sketching. I never sketch. I always make little samples or little models. And most of the times from the beginning I don't have an idea of what the outcome is. So if I do an experiment, it sort of becomes a logical step you in yeah you discover things within the material and then it automatically forms into a project like the oxidizing for instance metal comes in sheets if you want to make it three-dimensional you can go into a tube so to me it feels like very undesigned pieces but the story is more important of showing the experiment rather than the outcome yeah it is and also it could be more interesting and more fun yeah. during the design process yeah. good there are some new, 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 new ask. What inspires you? Um, well, because I have a background from my parents in art, I get most inspiration from the art world, mostly sculptors, very minimal art. Um, actually more than design itself, because I, this is the first year I haven't been to Milan, because it goes on and on and on. And you always get a bit like uh, adrenaline from it. Oh, I have to work again, I have to do more. Um, so in general, it's mostly nature and art and factories. I love to visit factories, go to suppliers, see what they can do. And a lot of ideas actually come from a weird machine in the corner or... An endless inspiration, right? Exactly, yeah. Ah, which country do you have taken inspirations? Uh, well, one of the benefits of being a designer also of sitting here is that you get to travel a lot, meet different cultures, I mean even see the work here is great from the Zlin Design Week and it's, it's always such a difficult question, where do you get inspiration from? I mean, I just got inspiration this morning in the elevator of the hotel, so yeah, it's very hard to, to give it one specific meaning, but travel, uh, traveling definitely helps with seeing different cultures, different materials as well, locally sourced materials. So, yeah, taking the time off and having the space to think mostly brings the best ideas. Ještě dotaz publika? Nebude? Okay, let's finish. Thank you very much. Děkuji za pozornost. Thank you.